Come on in and grab a seat. <laughs> okay, I'm going to get us started. Um, this is actually the last program that we have until the new year. So have to wait for January for your other wisdom. Our speaker today is John Wood. He works for USDA as a wildlife specialist. And he has been in that position since 2013. He graduated from the University of Maine, Orono in 2011 with a BS in wildlife ecology, ecology, sorry. And he's worked with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. He's worked with big animals, bear, deer, and moose. He's worked with little animals like lobsters. So <laughs> quite diverse experience. And um, he's going to talk to us today about how to deal with wildlife in the environments we live in. So thank you, Susan. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for the introduction. Um, talk about managing wildlife pests and gardens today. Um, Again, my name is John Wood. I work for USDA APHIS Wildlife Services, which is Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Okay. Just a little bit about uh, today's overview, what we're going to be chatting about. Um, just to give you an idea of who we are at USDA, we'll talk about our mission kind of what role we serve and uh, throughout the state of Maine and, and nationally as well. We're a federal program, so we have wildlife biologists and wildlife specialists uh, throughout the country yeah. doing a very wide variety of stuff. We'll review some of the more common wildlife uh, species that um, are cause damage or are pests in, in gardens. Some of the laws that are pertaining to what you as homeowners are able to do uh, legally, whether it's just harassment of wildlife or actually legally removing, if that's um, what it ends up becoming. How to identify some different types of damage in gardens, and strategies for preventing that damage. Here's just kind of a, a simple picture we'll talk about from exclusion devices. Uh, various netting, cages, that sort of thing that you guys can consider uh, implementing in your gardens. So as I mentioned, there's kind of a, this is basic, the basic tier structure for who we are. It starts with USDA, which is um, a huge federal program that has a lot of different entities. So we fall under Animal Plant Health Inspection Service and Wildlife Services under that. Um, our mission overall is to provide federal leadership in managing wildlife conflicts uh, between humans and people. And so that the general mission is based on protecting people, protecting agriculture, and protecting wildlife as well. So just a little bit about um, protecting people. And this is uh, a big part of my job specifically is, is working at airports. Uh, we prevent wildlife strikes with aircraft, working with airport managers, um, here's some of the just pictures that indicate, you know, just how damaging wildlife strikes are with aircraft. So um, our mission there is to um, manage the, the habitat primarily. And you're going to hear this concept uh, today about integrating uh, different methods to accomplish your goal. Usually there isn't just one solution that's going to solve one problem. So uh, there can be habitat management, there can be exclusion, there can be harassment. Um, and so that's a lot of what we implement throughout our work, whether it's in this scenario or at airports. Um, a lot of it really starts with uh, non-lethal approaches. That's, that's the primary methods that we try to preach to everybody. We also do a lot of uh, protecting of property. Um, you know, in this example, in the top right, um, you're looking at a flooded road from beaver damage. Um, so we might um, work with the state and fish and wildlife to come up with solutions and whether it's water flow devices or exclusions, um, sometimes trapping. Um, 
We also do here's some woodchuck damage. We'll talk a lot about groundhogs and or woodchucks uh, today, um, but just where some asphalt has kind of caved in from the tunneling that they do. Um, we do have a large feral swine program that's throughout the state or the country rather. Um, there are some uh, Eurasian type swine that are in the state that are um, enclosed in large game shooting facilities. Um, and sometimes they can escape. So we work to prevent that. Um, here's some Osprey nests on utility poles. We work with Osprey and tower companies um, and just kind of preventing damage. Here's some uh, droppings on a vehicle at a, at a hospital. So we do, <laughs> we do, you name it, when it comes to human wildlife conflicts, that's, that's kind of our mission. Um, we also uh, have a large disease program uh, where we, um, prevent the spread of raccoon variant rabies, um, which is what's going on here. We capture and anesthetize animals, test them for rabies. Uh, we do large, um, perhaps you've seen it on the news, um, every fall uh, we drop uh, vaccinations out of uh, planes, um, hundreds of thousands of vaccinations that are essentially a trial run to try to prevent and um, push down where raccoon variant rabies exists in the state of Maine. Um, so we fly these transects and essentially conveyor belt uh, um, these fish polymer coated bit baits that the raccoons happen across. They consume them and become vaccinated for rabies to try to prevent the spread. Um, yeah. So that's one of our big projects that we have. Um, again, we do uh, this one here more recently. If you've heard, we have avian influenza uh, in the Northeast, um, and we do have cases in Maine as well. So. Um, we do a lot of duck trapping and we do a, a throat swab and cloacal swab, custom for avian influenza to see where it might exist throughout the state um, and release. And we're just trying to monitor, see where it's occurring, that sort of thing. And uh, we do also, as you might expect, uh, protect agriculture. Um, and so here's some, here's some photos just Again, and this is relevant in the sense of um, to garden pests as well. I mean, you, there are certain signs that you want to be looking for in order to determine what it is that you have going on in that garden. So um, you kind of have to be a little bit like a detective out there, you know, looking at tracks and scat and what's being consumed, what isn't. Um, so you could see anything from trampling, you know, in this scenario here. Um, you know, a lot of times trampling would be from larger mammals, maybe bears. Raccoons can also climb corn stalks and, and they'll fall and break the corn stalks or just being snapped. Um, so you're kind of like being a detective when you're out of the garden. Um, but in, in this photo here, you're seeing European starlings. Um, so a lot of times dairy farms will hire us where starlings can contaminate the feed. Uh, they're also eating feed that cows are eating. So, their fecal contamination into the cow feed, cows consume it, and then milk production drops dramatically. So um, we work with dairy farmers in that regard as well. Um, and here's just some other uh, pictures here, obviously. Uh, we don't do a whole lot of um, uh, predation management when it comes to coyotes and sheep, that sort of thing. But uh, as you get out west, certainly when you have huge production, you know, Montana, you know, livestock is the primary income for uh, for cattle production and, and our program out west does a lot of um, predation management and working with farmers on how to prevent that sort of thing. And this photo is just kind of showing some some browsing um, and and again to kind of reiterate that detective level work where you're looking at what's getting consumed. And then lastly, um, part of our mission too, um, where our mission is to protect wildlife, um, and so. If you're familiar um, in, the, in the birding world, um, you've probably heard of piping plovers um, and lease terns on the beaches of Southern Maine. Um, and so we do predation management to protect those uh, state threatened and endangered species that are being predated upon by raccoons and skunks and that sort of thing. So we're trying to promote their, their production, their chick production. Uh, we do a lot of research as well. Um, and so all of our management decisions and, and what we talk about is really fueled by, by our research branch. So um, you can see, I mean, this example here, you know, we, we do a lot of animal capture, um, we'll put transmitters on, um, 
one of our one of our specific ones in Maine is we uh, we catch a lot of raptors at airports and we we'll put leg bands on them, um, and we'll relocate them and then we can see you know what the return rate to the airport is if it's successful if we have to go further with those birds that sort of thing. So um, all of our management is based on research. We provide technical assistance, which is kind of like what we're doing here. We take phone calls um, and, and feel free, you know, if you have any questions or um, at the end of this, uh, feel free to, to email or call us. You know, we do, it's, you know, it's free to call us and chat about what your issues are. Um, and we do outreach and this sort of thing, like what we're doing today. Um, we are kind of a unique federal agency in that we can be hired. Um, and yet we also receive federally uh, federal funds as well. Um, the federal funds go more towards the disease aspect, even influenza and rabies research, that sort of thing, where if somebody wanted to hire us to perform duties, um, whether it's dealing with own garden house, um, then, then we can be hired to do that sort of thing. And, and we'll have, a, I do have a slide on, um, who you could contact if you got to a point where you really need somebody's help. Um, so we'll get into that. All right, so most of you probably know all of these animals, I would imagine, um, on here. Maybe not this one. Does anybody know what this one is? Oh. A bowl? Yeah, metal bowl. Um, so, yeah, that one, I have some slides on identifying that type of damage versus moles because they get confused. Um, but that, other than that, I'm sure you all are know, know the, the common pests here, but we'll... Uh, we'll get into kind of identifying some different problems with each one. Uh, how about, do you guys know every, every one of these? What about this one? Cedar, Cedar wax one. Yeah, exactly. And how about this one here? Starling. Starlings. Yeah, European starlings. Um, Ring-billed gulls, you know, they're probably less so in, in backyard type gardens, but they definitely are an agricultural problem, especially when it comes to blueberry fields. Um, they're, they're very common. All right, this is a very busy slide, so I'll try not to be overwhelmed by it, but it, like you said, Susan, right, this is going to be recorded, and if you wanted to actually read this, um, but I'll just go over kind of some of the highlights, but, um, you know, before you get into what the common species are and what you, what you want to do, um, you want to know what can you do legally, right? So um, for this, this, this comes from what's called Title 12. Its main statute. Uh, so this is verbatim what what laws are when it when it comes to um, animal damage and what you're able to do. Um, so the big one. So essentially, the state is granting permission to kill nuisance animals or wild turkeys um, when they are causing damage. Um, and so there is provision legally to be able to do that. Um, what to, to keep to go down a little further and it kind of gets into a little bit of specific animals and i'll have a another slide too that kind of breaks it down a little bit more simply but um the commissioner is the head of maine fish and wildlife that's they they're appointed by the governor um, and so the commissioner has the ability to um, alter uh, statute in this case so the commissioner when it comes to bears as well i don't know if people are dealing with uh, beehives or um, for, for whatever they may be growing, but um, that you may be able to get a permit to um, for a licensed beekeeper um, to protect your beehives from damage from bears uh, through legal control. So in any case, what, what my recommendation with this slide is, is to, if you know that you're experiencing damage and you've gotten to a point where exclusion or harassment um, just isn't working and you've gotten to that lethal control point, um, it's easy to, to let your game warden know, you know, contact me, Fish and Wildlife, your regional biologist, and just let them know where you live. Um, it's easy to call them and just say, look, this is what I'm dealing with. I just want to make you aware, you know, because we're not... My, my agency is not regulatory in any way. Um, I'm just providing, you know, this information so you know that there, there are opportunities for people who are experiencing damage to be able to legally uh, leave, use lethal control. When it comes to birds, um, a person 
may not take or kill wild birds with the exception of these species. So English or, or European house sparrows, um, I call them the Walmart sparrow or Home Depot sparrow. Yeah. Those are the ones that you that you see every time you go there. Um, European starlings, rock pigeons, also known as rock doves, and wild turkeys. And so the reason that those birds are listed under state statute is because they're invasive species, um, except for turkeys. Turkeys are a state um, controlled species because they're not migratory. They live and never move within the state boundaries. So they're controlled by the state. So these first species here are invasive. Therefore, there's no federal protections on them. Um, when it comes to deer, uh, I thought this would, some might find this interesting. Um, so whenever deer are causing damage to orchards or, or crops, um, the department may furnish to the landowner um, suitable repellents. So there are options through the state um, that you can pursue that. So again, if you want to contact me, Fish and Wildlife, um, and, and bring this up to them. Um, and then lastly, um, to keep deer from damaging uh, young orchards, uh, the commissioner may enter an agreement with the, with the landowner uh, to um, essentially uh, take over half of the cost of fencing. Um, so that one could be useful uh, to those with orchards as well. So um, again, reach out to IFNW and, and, and bring that up. And this is again, Title 12 statute if you want to find that. It's pretty easy to navigate. You just search that main Title 12. Okay, so we just we just kind of went over the legalities of non-migratory birds uh, and mammals, um, and that's a little different for those that are migratory birds. <clears throat> so migratory birds fall under the Federal Migratory Bird uh, Protection Act. So you have to have permits in place in order to take any migratory federally protected bird species. You don't need a permit to just scare them or harass them <laughs> off of your, your garden. You, you can do that, except if they're endangered or threatened or vulnerable to this. Um, so odds are good, especially if you can easily identify the more common ones, and you know, the ones that we just showed are not threatened or endangered species, but if it's certainly something that you don't know and you're unsure of. Um, it would be a violation of the Endangered Species Act to simply harass. It's still a form of take. Um, so if there was something you weren't sure of. I don't know what that bird is. Might be best not to harass that species if they figure it. Um, so as I mentioned, anything, any anything that isn't um, a non-migratory bird like turkeys or grouse, um, you would need a federal depredations permit for uh, to be able to lethally remove any of those bird species. Um, and conveniently, if that's something that you wanted to pursue, um, just you give us a call and we kind of help you through the process. We don't supply the permits, but um, we'll certainly help you to acquire them from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who's the issuing agency. Um, there is a Canada goose, uh, because Canada geese are migratory, so they would normally require a depredation permit. In certain agricultural uh, uh, instances, you wouldn't have to have a federal permit for Canada geese. So there are what's called depredation orders where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife has certainly accepted that there are either so many of that species and they get so many uh, uh, requests for depredation permits for those species that they've essentially said, you don't need a federal permit to do this. For this species. So those depredation orders, um, there is one for an agricultural producer um, you, that can take Canada geese from lands that are um, that they personally control or own when they're causing damage to crops. Um, the, the federal depredation order goes further as well, um, indicating that you would not need a federal permit for crows, uh, common grackles, red-winged blackbirds. Those are the, the bigger three um, that do commonly cause uh, damaging gardens. Um, and I would just say that if, if you are, are desiring to pursue a Canada goose permit or 
um, any of those birds, especially American crows. Um, again, just it's easier and everybody likes to be on the same page to just contact me, Fish and Wildlife, and just express your interest that that's what you want to pursue. All right, so um, this kind of simplifies it a little bit. So these are what Maine Fish and MDI and uh, Maine Fish and Wildlife um, considers to be home and garden uh, species where no permit or permission is required. And <clears throat> so these are animals that um, have some sort of hunting or harvest season associated with them. Um, all, over, all of them require game warden biologist uh, consultation, um, except for raccoons, skunk, possum, and gray squirrels. And importantly, too, um, because capture and, and, and translocation is an option, um, but there is statute saying that they cannot be relocated greater than five miles. Mm -hmm. um, and that's based on the spread of rabies. Um, so anytime that you capture any animal that could be potentially infected with rabies, just definitely consider that that is the case. They don't always um, display the symptoms that you might think. They're not always strange acting. It takes it can take multiple weeks for them to even um, start to display the first characteristics of rabies. So um, if you do choose to, to trap them or translocate, um, or euthanize, um, just be considering that, you know, wear, wear personal protective equipment and gloves and really be thinking that that could be a potential. Uh, that one was additional. So bears are a little bit different too if you are having bear damage, um, where they're a big game species, you really want to consult with Maine Fish and Wildlife prior to any um, ideas. But her, again, harassment or just um, exclusion, any of that stuff that we'll talk about, you guys are, are welcome to do without permission. It just comes down to lethal control where you really need to understand when to call and when you don't have to. Um, so I mentioned the Endangered Species Act. So um, depending on where you are in the state, um, obviously, you know, so Canada links um, is the top one, uh, federally threatened. Um, they're really not going to exist south of Bangor. Um, so you don't really have to worry about that, but certainly Southern Maine, um, New England Cottontail, um, I would say from, it's really very, very Southern Maine, but potentially as high as Portland. Um, so we do have invasive Eastern Cottontails as well that have made their way into the state, which are essentially indistinguishable from New England cocktails. It takes a DNA test to both tell. <laughs> so essentially, if you see a rabbit, um, and particularly a cocktail rabbit, um, assume that it could be New England cocktail, um, and that you can never take a threatened or endangered species from anyone's permission, regardless of damage. Um, so just be very careful when it comes to rabbits and cottontails they, they call them that because they look like they have a cotton ball as a tail um, so when you see them running away it's that white white rump patch that's running away so just be aware of those those legalities <clears throat> and just just briefly um because it can be a little confusing so there's the state and then there's the federal so Again, state is for all mammals and non-migratory birds. Federal is for all migratory bird species. So kind of shifting into uh, a little bit more, I guess, of, of the fun stuff, if you will, um, and just kind of identifying damage. So like I mentioned, you kind of need to be a little bit of a detective um, and just kind of you know, really pay attention to what you're seeing for sign. Um, you know, just kind of take notice of, of what's being eaten and where is it a certain portion of the garden? Um, are there are there any tracks? Most commonly, there will be. Um, and I have some examples of different kinds of tracks that you can be looking at to try to help you narrow it down because you really don't know how to respond um, until you know what you're dealing with, right? Um, 
you know, so here's here's a turkey track, and here's some evidence of, of just trampling, you know, and, and a lot of times too, especially with turkeys, it's hard to understand how why are they actually um, destroying the plant itself, or are they just trampling it, or is that is a very common thing with turkeys, and a lot of times with turkeys too, it looks like they're causing damage, and sometimes they're just eating the bugs that are in amongst the plants. You know, they're just pecking. So sometimes it takes a little bit of a watchful eye. They can be accused as the culprit a lot um, when sometimes they're they're really not doing anything but eating bugs going down the rows. Um, so just because you see a turkey trap, just kind of look look to see what is it happening. So a lot of times they'll eat seedlings and they will pluck out smaller, um, but um, it's less common for them to want to take bites out of out of uh, more mature plants. Um, probably some of you have, have seen these, these holes here. They're, they're woodchuck holes. Um, and so a very obvious sign of what's going on. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about those later, but there's ways to know if it's active or an inactive hole um, to help you know if that was just years ago, it was a hole. I don't have to worry about that. It's not the culprit. Um, and so I have a, a slide later on that, but just kind of really pay attention um, about what's going on and, and, and be watchful and, and not too quick to assume that it's one thing over another. Uh, contamination too is, is another um, form of damage. So, um, you know, we've worked with um, organic farmers and even if scat touches the plant, it's no longer considered viable for sale. I mean, it can be down to that uh, degree. So just having scat um, in, on product um, is, is a problem. So I think tracks, you know, are one of our tracks and scat are, are, are one of the best signs too. You can oftentimes in, in garden environments, it's, it's softer soil. So they leave really good impressions and you can really understand what's going on there. But um, you know, here's just kind of examples of what you'd see for raccoons. Um, raccoons have bigger hind feet than they do front. Um, and so the pad on the hind foot is going to be a lot longer um, than the front feet on a raccoon. Um, here's some turkey damages, uh, or turkey tracks, excuse me, and, and, and just an example of scat. Uh, deer tracks, deer, deer are hard to, again, don't, uh, just because you see deer tracks, to, um, uh, don't jump to the conclusion that it's them. Um, but uh, sometimes it takes just careful observation, direct observation. You know, when you think these animals are out, um, you know, just keep a keep an eye. Uh, we use tra uh, trail cameras too, as well, to help you identify. Uh, oh, here's the the active uh, woodchuck burrow uh, kind of tip. So, if they have um, little flies that are coming out of the hole um, and really freshly disturbed dirt. Um, oftentimes they're going in and out all the time. Um, they're um, a daytime species. It's almost never see woodchucks out at night. I've only ever seen one out at night. It was the weirdest thing. Um, and so they're coming in and out all the time. And so a lot of times the as they're coming out, they'll disturb the dirt and, it, and the disturbed dirt will look darker with it's got moisture in it still. Um, and you'll see tracks and you'll almost always see little flies coming in and out. So if you don't see those, those things and you see you know a bunch of leaves kind of in the hole or weeds kind of growing over it it's it's just not going to be active um, so you can kind of rule it out this is kind of the the digging slide if you will um, to try to give you an idea of the difference between because we get asked you know mole is it mole or bowl um, and so the bigger culprit for for garden pests is, is going to be voles. Um, Moles tend to want to eat the insects that are in the soil, and voles want to feed on the plants themselves. Um, so voles, the best way to describe it, are more more commonly um, on the surface, and so they don't have these extensive deep holes that are running um, underground. They have these kind of squiggly um, trails that are almost under the grass, almost as as they're. Um, travel corridors, um, and then 
the moles actually, that's what they're doing. They're excavating out um, tunnel systems and then pushing out the dirt at, at the entrance. So that's where you see those, you know, brown piles of dirt. Those are those are moles. And and again, that's to treat for moles, you want to treat the insects. That's why they're there. Um, and then skunks, um, you know, they're they're also looking for the insects in the in the in the grass. And so um, if you see those very concentrated holes, you know, half dollar size holes, and then they move on and make another one. And, and so that's that's kind of the difference in the diggings um, to give you an idea of who, who's the culprit kind of. So what you're gonna hear, and I've, I've mentioned this already um, a little bit, it, it's very much to do with an integrated pest management. So there isn't just one solution commonly that's going to resolve the problem at hand. Um, you want to anticipate, you know, and, and use what you've had happen over history. You know, I've had typically have this, this problem or, um, um, and then, then use that information um, based on historical, you know, how to prepare. And I'll, we'll give you some tips on how to exclude and, um, and that sort of thing later. Um, it's common for people to kind of act, you know, before you plant or, you know, before the seeds even hit the ground because different stages attract different wildlife. Some want the seed, some want um, the seedlings, some want the adult plants. So acting as soon as you are about to plant is best. We'll talk about exclusion and, and this is sort of kind of the stepwise approach that you would take, you know, you would after you exclude, you just keep keep monitoring, make, making sure it works. Sometimes, you know, animals are, are very persistent and they can exploit the smallest um, detail that you may have overlooked. Um, and so you kind of have to go with an exclusion type and then adjust as you're seeing them react to it. Um, and there's different ways to do that. Uh, people have put up um, sort of that rubber netting for woodchucks and, and then they found it while they're climbing it now. <laughs> so, um, you know, so there's different things that you can do. So if you find that, you know, leave the top part of the of the netting loose. So as they get to the top, they just kind of teeter back, right? <laughs> and fall back. So um, there's ways to to kind of monitor it and react, and it's it's not an easy thing, you know. And we take a lot of phone calls about different things, and and sometimes it's right out of the gate you can find a solution, and other times you kind of have to troubleshoot. Um, so we talked about potentially needing permits that you can you can harass as long as they're not threatened and endangered. Um, you do have options for lethally uh, pursuing uh, either through shooting or trapping uh, or relocation as well. And then of course, evaluation for if, if, if what you're doing is, is working, of course. Um, Okay, so here's here's some things just to kind of get you thinking about a lot of different ideas that you could uh, pursue. Um, habitat management, I do have a slide a little bit later on, but um, the idea, you know, is that you kind of want to create a neat structured looking garden um, where vegetables or whatever it may be is harvested quickly and not just left um, so you want to try to maintain a neat, um, hopefully fully excluded garden. Uh, there can be a lot of different ideas out there. And sometimes you kind of just have to think outside the box a little bit. Um, you know, it can be as simple as just sort of auditory devices. You know, animals don't like noise around them, especially unpredictable noise. So some you could hang wind, wind chimes, or you could go as far as pursuing pyrotechnics, which are a very cheap and actually very effective way. Um, so these here, I mean, you can get, you know, a pistol launcher uh, for, I think they're $50 maybe, and then a hundred rounds of, of pyrotechnics for another 50. And they work very, very well. Um, we use them all the time on the airports. It's hundreds a day are going off at the airport to to harass and scare primarily birds away but it works great for mammals too um so just a very good non-lethal tool 
um, depending on the, the production and, and what we're talking about for a garden or agriculture, um, some larger scale producers will choose what's called propane cannons. Um, they they go off essentially. It's um, the propane builds and hits an igniter and makes a loud bang and and scares off the wildlife off the product. Um, this one here is just showing another idea is is uh, a predator kite, um, and so you can uh, affix these kites around the around the area and it works well, especially on uh, fruit crops um, for birds like cedar wax wings or American crows. Um, and so the kite just is it, in this case kind of looks like an osprey. Um, and so just it, giving you just how many ideas there are out there. And there, again, depending on what your situation is, you know, feel, feel free to call us and we'll kind of troubleshoot what might be the best one for you. Um, this one here um, is kind of a, a predatory or bird in distress uh, audio visual. Uh, and so it, it essentially plays at different interv intervals. You can change how often it plays, when it plays, um, but it, it projects uh, birds in distress and you can pick the species that's causing uh, your damage. So if it's you're having um, startling damage, you can change it. So it will say um, beyond starlings where they're in distress um, and it plays that audio uh, recording. Um, or even just as simple as people have had great success with just playing a portable radio at night, you know, or just in, at your, depending on the scale of the, the garden side, of course. There are chemical repellents out there as well. Um, you know, lots of products on the market. Um, I would say more more commonly for for bowls. I would say um, would be would be a good option. Um, uh, and something else that people might not think of as well. Um, just we're, you're trying to reduce the overall attractiveness of the whole property um, to birds and and other wildlife, especially bears as well. So removing those items that are attracting wildlife in general uh, to the property, uh, removing bird feeders, making sure your trash is secured. Um, as we know, that can promote uh, raccoons uh, to the property as well and, and compost that are open, um, maybe enclosing those, fencing them in, just trying to think of it outside of the box of the garden itself to the property that you have and trying to reduce the attractiveness. Um, so those are kind of the non-lethal and just kind of moving down um, through lethal control. There are toxicants for genocides. I mentioned that um, uh, for bulls as well. Um, there are gas cartridges and and, and state law it does say um, that homeowners are allowed to use gas cartridges for woodchucks. Um, we do we have we have used them, um, particularly in airport environments, um, and they're they are very effective. Um, you can you can buy them anywhere really online. Just gas cartridges for woodchucks. Um, just make sure you read the label very carefully if you choose that, just because um, it's unsafe to use that gas cartridge um, under, especially under a home or anywhere anyone can occupy or under a shed, uh, which is where woodchucks like to go a lot of the times. Um, but uh, that is a lethal approach. Um, trapping. Uh, I have some tips uh, a little bit on on capturing if that's what you're uh, going to pursue. Uh, but cage traps are are really the, the go to. Uh, there are many many different sizes. If it's squirrels that are causing damage, all the way up to I mean they give you dog size cage traps. So um, my preference is generally the raccoon size, which I think is fourteen by sixteen or so. Um, those are the best all around size. Um, we talked about shooting as well. Um, habitat management. Um, again, let's go down through these. So kind of like I mentioned, uh, just what you're trying to do is, is reduce the amount of diversity and habitat type that you have on the property. Um, and just keeping this diversity is going to increase the amount of wildlife and the diversity of wildlife that you have. The more diversity environment, the more diverse wildlife that you could attract. Um, so generally trying to keep it as neat as possible. And like I mentioned, remove the debris, harvest the fruits and vegetables promptly, um, trying not to leave them behind. 
so getting into some exclusion. Um, one of my favorite sites um, is Memphis Net and Twine. Um, they have every kind of netting you could ever imagine from batting cage netting all the way to literally specific bird netting. Um, it's very affordable. Um, netting can go a long way and do a lot of great things at a very effective cost. Um, so that, that's where I would recommend going towards um, for, for, for buying netting. That's where we get all of ours. Um, and then as far as, you know, completely excluding with fencing, um, one of the things that people overlook a lot of the times is that woodchucks will, will dig and they can, they can dig pretty far down too. So um, it's a lot more work, but backfilling, you know, a certain amount of fencing um, so that's underneath the ground, 12 to 18 inches or so is best. Um, versus finding that they're digging under and trying to just patch holes. They're just going to keep moving down. They're so persistent. So it's best right out of the gate to just commit to digging with your shovel and, and getting it down into the ground. Here's some more exclusion ideas. Um, some for individual plant species themselves. Um, others are a lot more creative. Um, uh, you know, sort, sort of a hatch system here where it kind of completely encapsulates the, the, the product. Um, this is more of a simplistic netting style. Um, you can get flexible plastic rods and, and buy your own netting through Memphis Net and Twine and, um, and just net it yourself uh, pretty simply. Just use zip ties, you know, particularly for bird species, obviously, in that case. Um, and then, you know... <laughs> If you're seeing those those voles or tunnels that are on the surface and you're dealing with voles, consider that they can also get underneath and come up from below. Uh, they're less likely to be on the surface and, and climb things and jump down in. So some people will put that hardware cloth kind of underneath the, the raised beds as well. Here's another creative idea for completely encapsulating. They just sort of hinge, you know, you get a hinge system on the end and um, you get this, what I call hardware cloth, which is just a, you know, flexible roll of, um, you know, quarter inch by quarter inch is, is good, um, particularly to try to exclude voles as well, be considering um, that it's not just birds or woodchucks that voles could get into. So the finer, um, smaller mesh size, I think is, is a good option. Some more uh, just exclusion or fencing types. We do have um, electric fencing. Um, uh, we do offer a program, and I, I kind of get into that in the next slide, where we can, uh, it's like a lease to own program for electric fencing. Um, but diff there's, there's different types of electric fencing uh, for, for different animals. Um, you know, essentially different mesh sizes uh, that will prevent, um, you know, woodchucks or raccoons versus deer. Uh, so depending on your problem, there are definitely different electric fence types um, and tricks to how to do it effectively. Um, so the, let's see, so here's our electric fence program. Um, it's distributes the cost over three years. Um, it's not permanent fencing, it's electric fence. So you take it up and down um, each year. Um, it's not, so like I mentioned, it's, um, this is a tool, a lot of people use it for deer. Um, sometimes woodchucks, uh, it's acceptable for if you get the smaller electric uh, mesh sizes, raccoons as well. Um, it's, and as I'm saying that it's big, primarily mammal exclusion only, it really doesn't do anything for birds. Um, and in our particular, uh, lease to own program, um, the cost is one third up front, and then it's distributed over three years. Um, oh, and then my electric fencing tip, um, especially for deer, um, what you're trying to do is um, negatively uh, impact them. So you, what you want to do is bait the deer to the fence, um, and then they get zapped by it and realize that that white fence actually does something. Um, so you just smear peanut butter and tin foil and, and fold it over um, the fence. And so the current is still transmitted through the tin foil. And they get that they get that reaction, um, and then they then they'll eventually just associate the white fence with with that. You won't have to keep keep uh, baiting them to it. 
And so some of these you may not have heard of or, or are thinking about, but, um, you know, and it depends. It just, again, on your particular scenario, but these are just a catch-all, trying to get your, get your thinking. Um, you know, wavy arm men are pretty great. Um, and, <laughs> and, um, I mean, they're so unpredictable, you know, they're flopping all around. They're pretty affordable too. You can unplug them at night and plug them back in or, you know, they're real affordable and easy. Um, there's uh, motion activated sprinklers as well, which are pretty great. Um, we've recommended both of these for, for goose damage situations as well. Um, you know, geese are coming up on a small piece of lawn on a lake. They set this up and it, it's, you can watch YouTube videos on it, uh, <laughs> and, um, for entertainment, but, uh, and then, so this picture here is just, uh, is showing what's called mylar. Uh, tape. It's it's not actually an adhesive tape. It's it's just a reflective um, strip. You can get it at different widths, usually two or one inch, um, and it's silver on one side, most commonly, and red on the other. Um, and there's ways to use mylar. Um, in this case, is is a great application because it's covering the entire area and it's not spanned so far apart. You can actually create sort of a, a complete covering, and it's a it's a visual deterrent for birds. Um, they don't like the flashing um, when, as the sun hits that, that shine, it creates a lot of flash. I'm not gonna really get into all the repellents on, but there's there are there are products out there available that, that do work well. We talked about propane cans already. Um, so trapping and translocation is an option. Um, I just, Kind of wanted to give a couple of tips for, for cage trapping real quick. Um, I think one of the, the more common mistakes is with, with setting a cage trap is just that the trap isn't stable. Um, and so animals are obviously going outside of their comfort zone to enter that structure, which is the cage trap. So if they enter it and it starts tilting when they're in there, they'll they'll just retreat out. They, they won't continue to go in. So I usually rake out a spot with and make it nice and flat so you can touch all four corners and it doesn't teeter at all um, so you want it stable you don't have to worry about putting leaves or grass in there on the wire mesh on the floor they'll, they'll walk right over it um, but for for woodchucks um, cantaloupe uh, is, a, is a really good one um, or fresh greens there are other products out there that you can buy it's a paste bait um, one of them is called whistle stop um because the um i guess the nickname for woodchucks is whistle pigs because uh, they whistle if, if you uh <laughs> loudly if you've ever encountered them they'll like a loud shrieking whistle um which can start be pretty startling when you aren't expecting it um so whistle stop is a good one raccoons is just marshmallows and anise um pretty pretty simple i mean that's that's all we use for our research we use three marshmallows and a little anise on the marshmallows and that's all you need um and like i mentioned make sure the trap is, is solid and not wobbly at all um yeah and so again lethal approaches are going to be your your last option right you're if you're trying to do all of your exclusion and keeping a tidy garden and doing harassment um and lethal will is, is kind of your last bet if you're really struggling but um snap traps are good um you know they, they come in various sizes you can get the mouse size or you can get rat size um and so um Definitely want to be a little more careful with the rat size because they are very snappy um, and will hurt if you get on there. Um, but I just, you know, I don't complicate it. It's peanut butter and oats or peanut butter and black sunflower seeds um, just kind of mixed together. Um, just a little bit smeared right on the pan. Um, works well for uh, bulls or chipmunks um, and squirrels. So for the, and, and so if you're targeting Squirrels or chipmunks too. You, you probably you you want to go with the rat size, which is a lot bigger. Um, and bulls is perfectly fine um, with the mouse size ones. It's kind of a similar approach to where you kind of want them. But we we call it bedding the trap where it's stable, so it's not just floppy and loose. Same idea. Um, I mentioned the, the gas cartridges and which are which fall under 
uh, toxicant, um, but not under sheds or homes because that smoke can permeate up through. And the idea with gas cartridge is that um, you put the gas cartridge in, it, it feels strange, obviously, you know, wear gloves, but you put it in, in the hole um, and then you cover the hole with like a sawed chunk um, so that um, carbon monoxide can't escape. Because yeah. um, if you see the smoke billowing out, it's not going to work. You have to contain the smoke within. So usually you have, um, and you'll notice with groundhog uh, burrows that they have, um, there'll be kind of vent holes that are, you'll see smoke coming out of when you use the gas cartridges and you just, you use, you know, available, um, usually just the dirt that the groundhogs kick out, you can shovel and put it over the top of the, of the smoke that is escaping. Um, groundhogs, I mean, you know, shoot, shooting is very effective. Usually an hour to two, um, before dark is when they, when they really come out, things quiet down and, um, that's the, the best hours. Um, I won't get too much into black bears here and we're getting close to the end anyway. So, um, but obviously you think big animals, you know, deer can bear, um, you know, even moose in northern Maine, if they're causing any damage, you, you really just, they're, they're treated up at another level than the home and garden pest that I mentioned. So it has to be a consultation with the Fish and Wildlife. And yeah, so there's a lot of information too on Maine Fish and Wildlife website on how to prevent just bear damage in general. Um, and as I mentioned, sort of the whole, um, property uh, perspective where you're um, securing trash bins and bringing in bird feeders and that sort of thing, because that's all fueling the attractiveness of the property. But usually those right there for bears uh, goes a long way. Um, and lastly, so just, you know, who can help? I mean, you know, as I mentioned, there, there's us, you can, you can give us a call and the number for our office was in there. Um, Maine Fish and Wildlife does have their own um, wildlife conservation officers that do help and can respond to different uh, damage uh, scenarios. Um, so that's a great one. That that kind of just got started, I would say, in the last three years or so. They're getting more and more um, um, uh, animal con control officers. And then they also have, there's a lot of private um, animal damage control agents out there. Um, and really just going on the website, uh, Maine Fish and Wildlife website, um, you'll, you'll find our, our name and contact information there and a whole list of people listed out by towns um, with phone numbers and, and who to call and, and all that. So um, Maine Fish and Wildlife is a good, a good resource as well. Um, and then Maine Department of Agriculture, um, Conservation and Forestry, um, if you were to search that and BACF.S, um, there's a lot of good information there as well. Um, some ideas on specific uh, animals that are causing damage. So uh, there's options for you out there. Um, and I'll just kind of rattle through these here. Um, you know, there's, there's a, it's kind of a heavy topic um, for, for how much time we have. You know, there's a, there's a lot to go over, obviously. So, um, Feel free to fill the question as best as we can here um, with the last minutes. Um, but you know, just having an integration of methods and and not putting all your bets on one thing. You know, they're they're persistent, and it it just it takes it takes time and it takes evaluation. You got to monitor, um, be very curious about what's going on in your garden. Walk, look for tracks, look for scat, look for animal sign that we talked about it try to truly figure out what it is. Um, exclusion is best. Um, and I mentioned who's who's kind of available for you to, to get your help. So um, with that, I will open it up to any, if there's any questions, yeah. You mentioned that coyotes and skunks have hunting season. When do they have that hunting season? Yeah, so, um, well, coyotes have no no closed hunting season at the moment, uh, meaning you can hunt them any day, all the time, except for Sundays. Oh. Um, 
I thought you meant the animals have certain times of year that they're out hunting. Oh, 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 yeah, sure, sure, yeah. I don't know there's, uh, yeah, hunting seasons for them, sure. And usually, if there's a hunting season for a particular species, it just means that they're afforded a little more protection and legalities um, versus the home and garden pests. Um, there is no hunting season for home and garden pests. Um, and so that's why they're not afforded those extra protections. Yeah. You said that your agency is not um, a permitting or a regulatory agency, but you mentioned others and it's, I'm not sure. For instance, fish and wildlife, mm -hmm. are they the ones that would give that would be regulatory and actually give out permits and accept fees for permits and so forth? Yes, yep, they are. And so the Maine Fish and Wildlife is going to govern all of those mammal species um, and the non-migratory birds like turkeys. Um, and so for anything, you know, deer, bear, moose, raccoons, um, that's where Maine Fish and Wildlife comes into play. They are regulatory. They have a law enforcement agency, as you know, with game wardens associated as IPW employees. So the wardens enforce those state laws. So yes, you would contact the, the regional Maine Fish and Wildlife biologist, which is easy to find on their website. Um, and they would then issue you a permit um, for state species. And the federal side of things is through the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, where we're USDA. Um, so we'll, if you were to pursue a permit for federally protected migratory birds, um, you can just call us and we'll we'll help you through it. But essentially it's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that would issue that for um, gulls or geese, you know, those sorts of birds. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. You mentioned early on that rabies is an issue with certain species, mm -hmm. which I find a little daunting personally. Yeah. Uh, have you any idea what incidence it is in things that we might see in our backyard, like raccoons and woodchucks? Sure. Yeah. Um, you'll you can find a lot of information on this, but there's really um, there's kind of a line where it exists and where it doesn't in the state of Maine, um, and so most of the very northern parts of Maine are rabies free. So Holton down through Katahdin west, south of, of that line um, is really where rabies is known to be. I don't want to use the word prevalent, but it's 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 around. You perhaps have heard of the, the town of Bath and how they've had a lot of rabies outbreaks and urban areas tend to promote rabies. Um, just because there's a lot more concentration of raccoons generally in urban environments. Um, I would just say, just because you saw a raccoon or you saw one during the day, I wouldn't be concerned so much. I guess if that comforts you, I would just say, if you were to try to capture one and you have a raccoon and your goal is to translocate it or to euthanize, just know that it could be carrying rabies. They don't necessarily act a certain way. They take up three weeks or so, sometimes before they even display any characteristics. Um, so we we treat any um, any possible carrier of rabies, whether it's foxes or raccoons, uh, possums. So it's um, just know that they could be carrying raccoons. Um, I certainly wouldn't put them in your car to translocate. You know, put it in the back of a truck. Um, use thick gloves. Um, if you're buying cage traps, most of the cage traps um, that I have seen. Um, where the handle is, like underneath the handle has a metal square that isn't holes, so they can't get through. So your hand's protected when you go to pick it up. And then as you're carrying them, they're, they're, they're pretty heavy. If you're going to translocate, you put it in the back of a truck, you really want to keep it away from your body because they can reach out of the cage strap and even bite through the cage strap. Um, so just... Um, Keep it away from your body mindfully, um, and then you can set it in the back of a truck. Um, but importantly, with the translocation, it's five miles. Um, so I think you were. Yeah, somebody online had a question about rodenticides, which you mentioned up there. And uh, if the if the rodent eats the poison, 
wouldn't ha it have it in its system and then uh, transfer it to a predator, a hawk, a bird, a cat, um, yeah. which might eat it. Um, is that a problem, an issue? It's, it, it's so bioaccumulation essentially is, mm -hmm. is what that is. So um, it is what I can say is that, you know, toxicants are, are legal to use. Um, so legality wise, um, you're able to use them for bulls. And I think there is a risk associated with that. Yeah. Um, I think that it's it's something certainly to consider, um, but I think that it wouldn't be as much of a problem as you might think, or I think it wouldn't be legally available. Yeah. You know, they, they do consider those types of, of things when they make things legal to use yeah. in public. So Does some of them get... Um... Sort of denatured and uh, right. in the rodent at all? And yes, it can. It can. Yeah, okay. exactly. So I, I think the risk of it is is low. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, I have a question. How long has the state of Maine been providing the um, vaccinations for the for the raccoons? Yeah. I know I I've been here for twenty two years, but prior to that, I lived in Connecticut and rabies was really rampant and yeah. so that's great news i mean how long has the state of maine been doing that this, this is fantastic yeah it's it's been a long time um i don't have the exact years but and 15 so, to 20. so where do they drop the pellets i mean if northern maine is kind of rabies free are they do they i bet you they don't drop them on the without a bath or oh i don't correct, know correct but, yeah but, we drop them on that line because uh, we do what oh, called, okay. um, it's a enhanced rabies surveillance. So we're collecting roadkill throughout that zone of yeah. where we know it to exist, yeah. um, which is hundreds and hundreds of, of roadkill, uh, coyotes, raccoons, foxes. Yeah. Um, and we test them. We collect brain, brain stem uh, tissue um, and test them. So we have all these dots on the map. And so um, we know where it exists and where it doesn't, so we drop it right on that line. And the idea is to oh, okay. creep it down okay. the state okay. until eventually we're literally ready to okay. great. So I that's, I mean, that's the goal. So I've got two other questions too. Yeah. One's about possums and their ability to eat ticks and their prevalence in Maine. Is that, I mean, I've heard that possums are starting to migrate up here. Yeah. And then another thing about the ticks, I know they aren't guarded pests. The moose that you know that are encumbered by these ticks and yeah. are kicking off. Are you ever gonna? Are you guys gonna do something about the ticks killing off the young moose? I know it's not a garden pest, but sure. you guys you started talking about the raccoons and yeah. So I don't know. Is that is that a possibility or is that? Um, what I can say. So I I used to so Lee Cantor is the the moose state moose biologist and he's got a lot of information on this. Um, because obviously it's a very hot topic with moose, um, which we're not really associated with, yeah. but just because I, you know, I have worked for Maine Fish and Wildlife and worked with Lee a lot. Um, it's so where possums exist and where moose exist are two very different things. Um, and so that would kind of debunk that theory oh, already. Okay. Um, but possums are, you see more and more road kills further and further, further north. Um, but uh, the moose problem really is in that heuristic, you know, high um, northern Maine uh, climate. So they don't really overlap uh, really at all. Um, and the other part of that is that the ticks that we experience down here, which are deer ticks and dog ticks, um, are a different species than what, are, than what the moose are dealing with. They're dealing with moose ticks or winter ticks. Um, so it's a completely different species. Um, it's very, very complicated. There's a lot of ideas out there about, um, you know, sort of vaccinating moose and doing, you know, all these drops and just, it's just, it's really, it's a, it's more of a density issue. There's so many moose and it's, and then it's perpetuating so many more ticks. Um, they're starting to do experimental moose harvesting zones where you harvest more moose, you end up having less ticks. And so you find that equilibrium of where you're not losing so many moose calves um, and you have a healthy moose population, but they're not being, basically they're getting anemic is what they're doing. They're, they're taking so much blood from the moose calves um, that they end up dying right, right before the spring. 
Um, so if they can get them past calves, they live. Mm -hmm. There really isn't any um, mortality events once they get past the calves. So we, 20 years ago, 22 years ago, we didn't lose in our backyard. You know, and now it's rare to see them, but they were, you know, they were eating yeah. the, <laughs> the stuff in the in the pond. But yeah, you know, was, I just, that was thank you. I just wondered about that. Yeah, unfortunately, they don't overlap. And I think at this point, the, the mission is to try to find that the use of regulated hunting um, to bring the moose population to a point where um, there aren't so many ticks perpetuating because of that. There's a happy medium and. Essentially, it's um, the hunters can benefit by harvesting and eating moose, or the ticks benefit by harvesting. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that's kind of the trade off. So, you find that balance. And I think that's what they're experimenting with with some experimental hunting zones where they're increasing cow permits and that sort of thing. That's why they're doing that. Um, but, yeah. So, sure. Time for a couple more questions if, uh, if there are any. Yeah, I think we had one. Oh, one yeah. back there? Okay. <laughs> Relative to relocating refuge, how was it determined that five miles should be the limit? We didn't come up with that per se. Um, I presume Maine Fish and Wildlife did. Um, and I think it's just, again, um, if you're trying to keep the rabies. Exactly. The exactly. Yeah, I don't know that more than five miles. That had to be. Yeah. Would be about like 17 for my body. Yeah, 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 no, and, and smart. it's a good point too, really, uh, because they are extremely resilient. It's amazing. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, even large geographical features like across the Penobscot or something, you know, you can try to use that, you know, to your, to your um, but they are, they're, they're resilient. Um, and so, that's kind of um, the decision model, I guess, if you will. Um, you know, you, you've done everything that you can, you know, reasonably to, to, to pursue non-lethal. Um, and, and then it becomes a decision on the landowner's part whether to go to lethal control and you have that ability at that point. If it's just, they're just coming back. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. Well, like, one of them unfortunately was rather this is many years ago. I want to get one of my animals and you know, to put it down, but yeah. it was in the city, so mm -hmm. we couldn't use it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so in in that case too, you might consider hiring somebody. Um, people, um, when you hire somebody, they're not always bound to the same restrictions that that the landowners are. So like, I called um, them. Many years ago. Yeah. But I called and they said, unless my son or I have been bitten, they couldn't do anything. Yeah. Well, there are animal damage control agents or us or whoever um, that, that would be able to use euthanization tools um, that landowners may not be able to in, in an urban environment if there's firearms restrictions or wherever it may be. Yeah, they don't um, want to send anybody yeah. out unless it goes with, I mean, retroactively, I could prove it, but. Yeah. You know, prior to that, they, they didn't want to send anybody unless it was definitely uh, public health. Mm -hmm. so, sure. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. Great presentation. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. So,